the joke is the bottle that can circulate in Twitter. The question is sort of what kind of message can we put in that, that particular bottle? And so for me, though, at, at times, it definitely becomes clear uh, that you become somewhat predictable uh, with, your, with your bag of tricks uh, that has been seen before, <laughs> continue to be seen. That's one of the few of my jokes that I like liked. Uh, <laughs> I'm the founding editor of a fictitious journal, uh, Nine Quarterly, which uh, I call a compendium of utopian negation. It's never ever going to happen to me that somebody will introduce me saying, I'm going to start with the article in the New Yorker. The construction of a Twitter aesthetic by Jason Fagone on February the 12th, 2014. I mean, it's recent, it's new, and it's the New Yorker. What isn't there to be light and deeply jealous and envious of? It, it wasn't in the print edition. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to write an academic book uh, on my dissertation topic, which was that of transparency as a metaphor, and I looked at it uh, in Germany uh, after the fall of the wall, particularly in architecture as a metaphor for democracy, openness, accountability, etc. In the year that I suppose mattered most in finishing this, pro this the book project I was working on, um, that is the year in which I discovered Twitter, uh, and in which I made sort of de facto decision that no, I'm not going to write this book, I'm going to write jokes. And uh, all of my friends and <laughs> my girlfriend at the time in the relationship all made me very aware of this fact that, uh, you know, they're going to fire you. <laughs> when I say failed intellectual, it's not just a joke. I mean, I did try to succeed, and, uh, and I'm disappointed that I didn't. And to be honest, I think, though, if I had not spent that time that year or, or, or the time after it on Twitter, uh, I probably still wouldn't have written that book. Uh, and I would have had nothing else that I was doing. I do, however, try to go beyond the language um, and go into some questions of philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> but this isn't simply name dropping, of course. I like to go into individual works. <laughs> like to go into uh, different philosophical traditions. <laughs> and uh, certainly do not stick to Germany as well. Uh, <laughs> I'm not trying to make anything easy, and I don't think I'm popularizing anything. I'm just trying to spark a curiosity. I mean, I'm not necessarily uh, uh, any kind of orthodox reader of, of, of Adorno. I mean, it's just kind of my own, uh, my own personal kind of uh, reading of his work that's, that's being enacted there. So for me, largely, I think that Adorno still has a lot to say, uh, in particular about questions of ideology, questions of power, questions of representation. But at the same time, in taking Adorno to Twitter, this is not Adorno. Uh, this is simply a figure that's, that's inspired by a certain perspective, but um, it's very much become my own as well. The objection that I dislike most is, uh, say, when I write some, some line and it's sort of Adorno never would have said that. Um, I've always been interested since I started studying literature and culture, uh, this intersection between uh, the cultural and the political, and that I think led me to a great extent to uh, modernism, it led me to study of the avant-garde, um, it led me to theorizations of that, and there's really no way around Adorno. And now what I'm more interested in is taking this perspective and this voice that I've developed and thinking about how it can apply it to things that are happening right now in the news. In fact, I've become much more kind of driven by contemporary politics, current events, um, which for me uh, provides this additional challenge. Even though people might have uh, come together surrounding my, uh, uh, my Twitter feed because they both like the same dumb Hegel joke, you know, the same stupid German pun, they, find, uh, they end up in conversation often about these kind of topics that are of real relevancy and they would not have come together otherwise. And that's, that's what keeps me interested in what it is that I'm doing. The craft of the short form, which what appeals to me about it so much is just that, um, and it's probably like obviously all writing, but it can always be better, always be better, but it also somehow feels within reach because it's short. Um, and I think that's what appeals to me about it so much. And, um, uh, and also it gets read, or at least has the potential to be read.
It's been interesting for me in sort of this new uh, position that I'm occupying uh, outside of the academy, but still with academic interests, people often ask about, it seems like you're doing all of these things that we should all be doing. All academics should be operating outside of the academy outreach, uh, having impact. There are lots of buzzwords surrounding these things, which um, as with most everything, <laughs> I have a fair amount of ambivalence about because there's part of me which have, of course is also concerned about giving academics yet another thing that they're supposed to be doing in addition to writing books and writing articles and teaching and, and meeting with students in office hours, etc. Uh, now you also should have a Facebook presence and a Twitter feed. Um, that concerns me somewhat. But probably the most important advice is simply that of don't become a bitter academic. <laughs>